Welcome to the InfoWars Nightly News. It's Friday, June 28, 2013. Now, it may come as a surprise to you, it certainly is a surprise to me, but Wesley Clark says that the American people like the NSA Stasi state spying on them. And that's the headlines of a Kurt Nemo article on InfoWars.com. Now, he made these comments last night on the CNN program Aaron Burnett. And as Kurt Nemo points out, Clark is a notorious war criminal who used cluster bombs and depleted uranium on civilians during his reign as the supreme commander of NATO forces. And he said that the American people love the idea of government illegally, unconstitutionally spying on them. He told Burnett, the quote, American people are solidly behind the PRISM program and all that's going on. He also told another person on the program, uh, said, Brooks underscored the establishment's claim that Snowden is a spy guilty of espionage, despite the fact that he's not accused of working for a foreign government. He's a 30-year-old spy. He's been charged with espionage, said Brooks. Well, this is what's dangerous about the leaks from Snowden, and this is what a lot of people are concerned about what is being exposed and the controlled exposure of this. What we're finding out is just a little tip of the iceberg that's being verified with these leaks. For a long time, people have known, and it's been brought out by whistleblowers right after September 11th attack in 2001, that the government was collecting all kinds of data on everyone, not limited to foreign collection like the FISA law supposedly allowed them, although there's question as to whether or not that was legally, constitutionally done. That also involved, if they could prove a connection, that involved spying on American citizens. But after September 11th in 2001, they just threw out any restrictions of the Constitution on spying on Americans. Now, the concern is that with these limited exposures, saying that they're just collecting metadata, they're just looking at some relationships on these databases as part of the PRISM program, that this is a way of gradually exposing the American public and getting them to be accustomed to and accept this kind of espionage. That's why it's very important for people to speak out. It's also very important to draw the distinction between espionage and whistleblowing. What Snowden did in no way exposed any classified information that helped an enemy. What he did was he pointed out criminal, illegal, unconstitutional behavior of our government. And for that he's being called a spy. Now talk about having your home bugged. Check out this. This is an article from U.S. News Reports, and they're actually working on ways to control cockroaches uh, by remote control using game controllers. Now, this is being told, you can see a picture right there of a, a cockroach with a little IC uh, wired onto his back right there. Um, I guess it's a different way of bugging your house, uh, literally bugging your house. Now, they claim that they're going to use this to help look for victims during disasters, but... Uh, I don't think that's the main thrust of our government, trying to locate people in disasters. I think the main thrust of our government is spying on us, looking at everything that we're doing. And uh, just be aware that even the, the literal bugs in your house may really be bugs for the government. Now, we also have some human cockroaches, some bugs on two legs. And a story in Wired magazine uh, points out that a WikiLeaks volunteer was actually a paid informant for the FBI. From the article, they say, on an August workday in 2011, a Cherubic 18-year-old Icelandic man, this 18-year-old Icelandic man named Sigurdur Sigi Thordarson, walked through the stately doors of the U.S. Embassy in Reykjavik, his jacket pocket concealing his calling card, which was a crumpled photocopy of an Australian passport. He took a photocopy of Julian Assange's passport. He was a longtime volunteer for WikiLeaks with direct access to Assange and a key position as an organizer in the group. And he turned in Assange and WikiLeaks, he betrayed them to the FBI for a total of about $5,000, a little bit more than 30 pieces of silver for this Judas. The FBI flew him internationally four times for debriefings, including one trip to Washington, D.C., and on the last meeting obtained through Thorderson eight hard drives packed with chat logs, video, and other data from WikiLeaks. Now, Stephen Aftergood of the Federation of American Scientists Project says it's a sign that the FBI views WikiLeaks as a suspected criminal organization rather than a news organization. WikiLeaks was something new, so I think the FBI had to make a choice at some point as to how to evaluate it. Is this the New York Times or is this something else? They clearly decided it was something else. Well, 
the government doesn't offer any deference to official news organizations. How much more official and more mainstream do you need to be than to be the, Ameri the Associated Press? And yet the government was spying on them. The government was treating them as if they were criminals. The government treats everyone as criminals, as guilty, before you even have a chance. There's no indictment. They don't have a reasonable cause to bug your conversations or to intercept your data. They just do it. And that is clearly unconstitutional. They're exposing these criminal acts is what these people are actually doing, what WikiLeaks is actually doing. And when you do that, the criminals are going to come after you. Uh, we've, that brings us really to our daily quote today from David Brinkley. And he says that a successful man is one who can lay a firm foundation with the bricks that others throw at him. Well, the FBI and other government agencies don't just spy on people. If you remember the interview we had last week with Dr. William Pepper, he talked about how the FBI and other government agencies were involved in the assassination of Martin Luther King. And we see in an InfoWars report, we have an FBI document that plots to kill Occupy leaders if, quote, deemed necessary. Now, this was something that came off of an FBI website, and from the document it says, an identified blank, as of October, planned to engage in sniper attacks against protesters in Houston, Texas, if deemed necessary. An identified blank had received intelligence that indicated that protesters in New York and Seattle planned similar protests in Houston, Dallas, San Antonio, and Austin, Texas. Blank planned to gather intelligence against the leaders of the protest groups and obtain photographs, then formulate a plan to kill the leadership via suppressed sniper rifles. Pay attention to that last bit again. This is from the leaked document, well, actually the declassified document from the FBI. It's a redacted document. Someone was going to formulate a plan to kill the leadership via a suppressed, that's a silenced, sniper rifle. If you remember when we were talking about uh, Adam Kokesh's planned 4th of July march, that the D.C. police chief, police chief Lanier, said that uh, they could tolerate disobedience from protesters. Well, that's not disobedience if you're protesting. It's not a criminal action. That is constitutionally protected speech. That's expressly mentioned in the First Amendment. She went on to say that when he did actually involve, if he would have actually involved in civil disobedience, that that would be violating the law. Well, yes, that's what civil disobedience is. But it is not disobedience to protest. And that's what these Occupy protesters were doing. And because of that, because of just constitutionally exercised free speech, the FBI drew up contingency plans to kill by a silenced sniper rifle the leaders of Occupy. That is very amazing. Shouldn't be. We've seen that sort of thing before, but uh, hopefully this will get wide coverage. Now, the government kills us, spies on us, but it doesn't just stop there. There's also a constant harassment of our citizens. At 2 a.m. Thursday morning, the New York City Council made a decision that's going to affect the stop and frisk program. The cops know who the wise guys are. They know who the dealers are. They know who Supporters the of the Oversight Committee see the move as a way to keep an eye on a police department that has been targeting specific groups. But how will this measure be enforced? Intro 1079 creates an independent inspector general to monitor the police department, and Intro 1080, according to the Atlantic Wire, would allow individuals to sue the police department in state court, not only for individual instances of bias, but also for policies that disproportionately affect people in any protected categories. Mayor Bloomberg told churchgoers in Brownsville, Brooklyn, that the program keeps guns off the streets and keeps New Yorkers safe. Through these stops, the police have recovered thousands of guns over the past decade and tens of thousands of other Mayor weapons. Mayor Bloomberg said no it would leave the NYPD pointlessly hammered by outside intrusion and recklessly threatened by second-guessing from the courts. In the past, Bloomberg said that it should be amended and not ended. What does this really mean? Somehow, I have a feeling that it'll go somewhere along the lines with limiting hot dogs and making sure that you can't have a large Slurpee. Thank you, Mr. Bloomberg. Check out PrisonPlanet.tv. You can give your username and password to up to 10 people. I'm G. Giornetta with an InfoWars Nightly News Alert. 
Now, in economic news, there have been some tapes that have been made public by an Irish newspaper that actually catch Irish bankers plotting to defraud the Irish government and, of course, the Irish taxpayers. In an article from The Guardian titled, Irish Bankers Hoodwink the Government Out of Over Bailout and Secret Recordings Show This, there's a couple of quotes here. A top banker with a financial institution that almost bankrupted Ireland boasted that he had picked the figure of 7 billion euros and told the Irish government it was needed to rescue the Anglo-Irish bank. He reportedly pulled this, as he said, out of his arse. Yeah, and that number is seven. But the reality is that actually we need more than that. This is from his recording. He says, you know, the strategy here is you pull them in, you get them in to write big checks, and then they have to keep, they have to have support for their money, you know. And then he goes on to say, if they say, if they say the enormity of it up front, they might decide, they might decide they have a choice. You know what I mean? They might say the cost of the taxpayer is too high, but... Uh, if it doesn't look big at the outset, if it looks big, big enough to be important, but not so big that it kind of spoils everything, then I think you have a chance. Here's some more clips. You have the check here now for the loan. Yeah. That would be the first thing I'd ask. I'm going to keep asking the tech question. When, when is the check arriving? We need the moolah. You have it. So you're going to get to us. And when would that be? We'll start there. Yeah. And by the way, the game has changed because really the problem is now on their door. It is, yeah. yeah. Because if they don't get it on Monday, they have a bank collapse. Just some petty criminals plotting something. I mean, th these two guys, their names are Bo and Drum. It sounds like an Irish folk band, but actually they're just a bunch of criminals. And what they were doing was they deliberately came up with a low ball figure for what it was going to cost to bail out this bank knowing that they were going to pull in the Irish government, and then once the Irish government had committed, then they would reveal the full extent of the commitment that was going to be necessary, which was not 7 billion euros, but more like 30 billion euros. And we see this sort of thing has happened over and over again. We, this happened in the United States when we were told that it was going to be massive rioting in the streets and martial law because the banks were about to fail. And instead of bailing out the mortgagees, which they could have done with that amount of money, they could have paid off 75% of the mortgages in the U.S. Instead, all of that money went to the banks, and they continued to hold the mortgages, and they foreclosed on houses and took those houses after they were bailed out. But what we're seeing in Europe, as we see in Ireland, these bankers get the government to assume to socialize their losses. And then they come back and they say, we're, you're now insolvent as a government, and we're going to have to enact austerity measures on taxpayers. So they socialize the losses. They privatize the profits. They use their own failure, their own greed, as leverage to take over entire governments. And what we saw in Cyprus is that they went in and actually directly seized money out of people's bank accounts rather than just putting it on the general taxpayer. And now in Europe, they're starting to move to do that on a much broader basis. In an article from InfoWars, says, New EU plan will make every bank account in Europe vulnerable to Cyprus-style wealth confiscation. Did you actually believe that they were not going to use the precedent that they set in Cyprus? On Thursday, EU finance ministers agreed to a shocking new plan that will make every bank account in Europe vulnerable to Cyprus-style bail-ins. In other words... The wealth confiscation that we just witnessed in Cyprus will now be used as a template for future bank failures all over Europe. That means that if you have a bank account in Europe, you could wake up some morning and every penny in that account, over 100,000 euros, would be gone. The European Union spent the equivalent of a third of its economic output on saving its banks between 2008 and 2011 using taxpayer cash, but struggling to contain the crisis and, in the case of Ireland, almost bankrupting the country. But a bailout of Cyprus in March that forced losses on depositors marked a much harsher approach that can now, following the agreement on Thursday, be replicated elsewhere. Well, an even bigger destruction of wealth has been taking place gradually through regulation. You know, it was the Supreme Court judge who said the power to tax is a power to destroy. Well, that's also true of regulation. In an article from New American, the report is federal regulations cut standard of living by 75% over 56 years. They go back to 1949, and they point out in a couple of studies that the real cost of government in the United States is half again as much as the entire federal budget. 
It is approaching a third of the country's economic output. And the CEI said, and I love the name of this report, 10,000 Commandments, 2013. That's more like what we, I think that's maybe a conservative estimate of the regulations. But they point out that federal environmental safety and health and economic regulations cost hundreds of billions, perhaps trillions of dollars every year, over and above the cost of the official federal outlays that dominate the tax policy that we're debating on. Now what they did was a couple of economists there and also at the Journal of Economic Growth went in and rather than count the dollars, the authors took a unique approach and attempted, this is also in the article, to measure how much lower American standard of living is today compared to what it would have been if regulations had stayed at the level they were in 1949. They concluded that the average American household income would be $27,500 a month instead of the $4,400 a month that it is currently. Now, that may sound pretty amazing, but they, they summed this up in one more uh, area here. They said, whatever the benefits of any kind of regulation that we get from the government, what if you had an extra 300000 actually 330000 they come up with per year, to pay for health care, for housing, for environmental protection, and other things? If you look at what's happened with inflation, since 1949, we've lost 89% of the purchasing power of the dollar. So roughly take that down by about a factor of 10, and it's not $330,000 a year, but about $30,000 a year if we didn't have the kind of inflation we got. There's another wealth destroyer that's coming in. Well, the government is confiscating wealth for bankers. They're destroying our wealth with regulations, but they're also incentivizing businesses to hire illegals rather than American citizens. In a report from the Weekly Standard, they said 68 senators have voted to create incentives for employers to hire amnestied immigrants over U.S. citizens. The immigration bill that's passed by the Senate Thursday afternoon would give some employers a financial incentive to employ, quote, registered provisional immigrants, that is, illegal immigrants who've been granted legal status, over U.S. citizens. Now here's the way it works. Under Obamacare, businesses with over 50 workers that employ American citizens without offering them qualifying health insurance could be subject to fines of up to $3,000 per worker. But because newly legalized immigrants wouldn't be eligible for subsidies on Obamacare exchanges until after they become citizens, which would take place at least 13 years after the Senate bill, businesses could avoid such fines by hiring the new immigrants instead. So basically, if you don't provide health care for your American citizens, you are fined $3,000 per employee. But that is waived if you hire an illegal immigrant who's been given amnesty. How's that? Now, of course, the other advantage that businesses have of hiring illegals is our other taxes that have been put on for American citizens, like the Social Security tax, which the employer has to pay a matching contribution. If you're not registered, if they're not legally paying taxes, they don't have to pay that 7.5%. So there's a, been a long time financial disincentives for hiring Americans, especially at the lower end of the wage scale. And this is yet another one that the Senate would like to put on us. Fortunately, it looks like this is going to be a dead letter in the House, but this is what the Senate agreed to on Thursday and passed this. Now, we've got a very disturbing clip of a woman who suffered a home break-in. It's hard to understand the brutality of someone who would do something like this. But we need to show this sort of thing just because people cannot imagine that they would ever need to be able to protect themselves from other people because they can't imagine, since they would never do something like this, they can't imagine somebody coming into their home and doing something like this. This is just amazing. The children are right there on the couch, and he is just hammering her over and over again relentlessly. I mean, he's not after, after merchandise there. He, he's just going after her, brutally throwing her down the stairs, beating her in front of the children. Now, we have an Operation Paul Revere entry that I think kind of speaks to this in a really good way. Let's take a look at that. Growing up, did you have guns around your house? No, we never had guns around the house. We just never felt like we needed them. What about you? When we were growing up, there were no guns in the house because we can always call the police if we need help. 
Did you uh, serve in the military at all? In my family, there were none of us in the military, and we just uh, never did have any interest in joining. If someone was trying to break in or rob you, um, you would you would rather the police handle that? Yes, if I had a break in, I would prefer dialing 911, waiting for the professionals to come and try to find a, a way out of my home, either by negotiation or uh, just fleeing out an opposite door or window. I think guns are bad. They do kill a lot of innocent people. And we have professional law enforcement people to uh, enforce our laws and to protect us. And we, there's no need for homeowners to have guns. Citizens should not have guns. Now, this is just a few days later, it says on the video. And what happens is they have an intruder. Let me get the glasses. Really master bedroom. We've cut this a little bit to try to fit this in so you get the general idea of the video. All the other joining doors. Now she's locking the master bedroom. And right now he's on the phone to 911. And she said, be quiet. Now, what they do now is they rewind this, just like it's a tape, and we go back and we say, what if? And this is something that we all want to think, what if that woman had been armed? Growing up, did you have guns around the house? Yes, we had rifles, shotguns, <laughs> pistols. Uh, they were not in a safe. We, uh, we were taught as children not to play with guns, that they were dangerous, and we never played with guns. Yeah, we had uh, guns around the house, and we used it to go hunting for food. We had several guns. One double barrel, one once. <laughs> 22. We, we listened and we knew guns could kill. And even as kids, when we played cowboy and Indians, we knew we couldn't play with real guns. We had to use our cap guns. Did you serve in the military? Yes, I served in the military. I was in the U.S. Navy and the U.S. Air Force. Now here we are, played back with a different approach. This time they're armed. Alarm. <laughs> and that has a little bit different resolution to it. They actually put on their bulletproof vests and they start to hunt the intruder. He does call 911, but he is not helpless waiting for some help to come. He takes care of himself. It's the difference between self-reliance and being a victim. It's amazing to me that women are not the strongest supporters of the Second Amendment because it's the only way that a woman is ever going to have an equal chance. Women and the elderly, as they show in that video there. Excellent video from Operation Paul Revere. Uh, we've got a lot of really good entries. We're going to be showing them. Hopefully we'll have the site up by next week. Uh, we'll have a lot of Paul Revere entries for you to take a look at. You'll be able to comment on them. You'll be able to vote on them. And that full video is there. You'll be able to see how that ends. We edited that up quite a bit for the news tonight. Well now, it's not just our food that's being genetically engineered. Fox DC reports that the UK may actually approve creating babies with the DNA from three different people. Britain may allow a controversial technique to create babies using DNA from three people, a move that would help couples avoid passing on rare genetic diseases, said the country's top medical officer. The new techniques will help women with faulty mitochondria, the energy source in a cell, keep it from passing on to their baby's defects that can result in such diseases as muscular dystrophy, epilepsy, heart problems, and mental retardation. 
Now, as Alex pointed out today on the show, this is uh, the, the concern about this. Everyone wants to have as healthy a child as possible, of course. No one wants to have their children suffer from any of these defects. What we have to be concerned about, though, is that this may slide into a kind of eugenics, even a kind of mandatory eugenics, where the government has to approve your DNA, or maybe something like Brave New World or Gattaca, fiction works. They talk about how the government engineers the different types of people that they want to have in society, purposely creating different classes of intelligence. And I think we need to also understand that just because someone has a mental handicap, that doesn't make them any less of a person. And this was brought out in a great piece on CNN. It's very rare that CNN does anything that I really respect. And actually, in this case, it was not something that was written by CNN, but it was written by one of their contributors. It's a dad's confession. He says, I almost left my disabled daughter. And in this, he talks about how he was so excited about his newborn child and then so crushed when he found out that she had Down's syndrome. But listen to this quote from the article. He said, I also started forcing myself to interact with my daughter. She was desperate for me to start loving her, and she continued loving me until I broke down and did the same. I was scared to accept my daughter because that would mean accepting her disability. But the reality was that the only thing that kept me from loving my daughter was my own ignorance. Once I overcame my own selfish expectations for my daughter, I slowly began to see the beautiful girl that would change my life forever. Well, I think that's, we could say that's true of every parent and child relationship. Basically, looking at our children, getting rid of our selfish desires for them and seeing them for who they are and loving them for who they are. And that includes when something goes wrong because, you know, even if someone is not born with a health defect, anything can happen at any point in their life to make them handicapped or disabled. And it's a part of valuing human beings and a part of valuing life not to be so obsessed. Uh, certainly we want to do everything we can to make people healthy, but we have to be careful about sliding into some kind of a eugenics mindset. Now right after the break we've got an interview with a couple of filmmakers of State of Mind. So stay tuned. We'll be right back. Now you can watch Alex Jones live at Infowars.com forward slash show. You'll find links to all of our content there and a free 15-day trial for Prison Planet TV. You can also browse the network, the Infowars Nightly News, and over 60 movies and documentaries all together in one place. You can watch the Alex Jones Radio Show live as it happened. So check it out, Infowars.com forward slash show. Are we choosing our own paths, our own destiny, or has it been pre-selected for us? C.S. Lewis said, when training beats education, civilization dies. We need to always be cognizant of, as a free society, that information can be used as a weapon. Barrier to discovery is not ignorance, it's the illusion of knowledge. We are seen as nothing but biological androids. To gain control of education in America, not for a philanthropic purpose, but to change the thinking of the American people. From the time we're very young, we're taught to, you know, worship authority basically because that's our key to survival as young children. Discover the history, the present, and the future of mind control. From compulsory state education to the Hollywood media brainwashing machine, we are kept in perpetual bondage to the ideas that shape our actions. And the CIA scientists could actually film people who had been surreptitiously dosed with LSD. There's a brain entrainment process that takes place. That gives the government free reign to create whatever story or narrative it wants to create. Whatever the public face of something is, whatever they're talking about publicly, there's something else over here they're probably not looking at. How to engineer the opinion of the American people so that they would fully endorse, not only endorse, but demand a war. When you watch mainline establishment television, you are putting yourself in front of the barrel of a gun. Discover the history, the present, and the future of mind control, psychological warfare. 
brainwashing. Are we controlled and manipulated? You bet. That's mind control par excellence. Find out how deep the rabbit hole really goes with this new groundbreaking documentary film, State of Mind. Available exclusively at Infowars.com. The important thing about the Pro One filter today is that the material we use for removing fluoride and other heavy metals now will remove the latest form of fluoride called hydrofluorosilicic acid. There's no other fluoride reduction filter out there that will remove that type of fluoride. And it's extremely important because Today, we're hearing more and more cities are using that form of fluoride. We've been having medication forced on us through the water system for quite a while. Most people don't realize it. Most people don't realize the negative effects of fluoride. There's a wide range of health effects that are attributed to fluoride. Bottom line, why should somebody get this new Pro One Pro Pure filter? The reason to buy the Pro One, it's an all-in-one filter. It's convenient, easy to use. It doesn't require the add-on fluoride filter, and in addition, this filter removes the latest form of fluoride called hydrofluorosilicic acid. Welcome back. We're joined in the studio with the producers of this new film, State of Mind. It's a documentary available from InfoWarsStore.com. It's pre-booking now. We'll have an exclusive on it for the first few months. It looks like a great documentary. And uh, you can get also The American Dream, which is an animated film that explains a lot of the details of the banking system that we're strapped under. And I'm looking forward to really seeing State of Mind. I've just seen some clips from it, but we're going to talk to the producers of that here. We've got Austin Green and Chris Emery joining us here. Now, Austin, you also did editing on the film, is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Yeah. It's, a, it's a great film. You know, it, it surprised me a little bit because the first thing we think about when we think of mind control, of course, is what's come to revelation in just the last few years about the CIA experiments after World War II and going on to the current day. But you take a much broader approach to this. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, you know, whenever we first developed the concept for this film, you know, we had several different approaches that we could have gone with it. And, we didn't really want to repeat what had been done. There's so many other great filmmakers and uh, artists out there who have put out information like, like this. Uh, Scott Noble uh, created a film called Human Resources, which uh, you know heavily influenced us and in, in uh, you know the approach to this film. But you know we really wanted to take a broader approach and show how it all ties. Mm -hmm. many areas together mm -hmm. that, that create a, you know, a matrix of control. It's not, you know, one thing is controlling us or this thing is controlling us. It's putting all of these pieces together that, that create the framework that they, they control us. Yeah, you focus quite a lot on education, and that's something that uh, really got my interest because my wife had a master's degree in education. I remember when she was in school, she brought home B.F. Skinner's book, Beyond Freedom and Dignity, and I looked at it as like, it's about time somebody complains about the schools. Yeah, I had gone through the government schools, and, and uh, that was my taste. She says, no, 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 you don't understand. He's talking about how to do this. And so that was my epiphany at that moment, seeing B.F. Skinner's book. And so we resolved that we were not going to put our kids through that system. And, uh, but th this is something that's been planned for a very long time. As a matter of fact, you go back all the way to Machiavelli, right? Yeah, I mean, the systems of control go back thousands of years, but uh, Machiavelli was an interesting character that, you know, really kind of crystallized how they were going to go about controlling the masses of people because, you know, at that time, you know, they didn't have gigantic armies or security forces, and so they had to rely more on psychological manipulation to keep the masses happy because, you know, as we all know from the French Revolution, you know, if you don't uh, keep a handle on that, uh, the yeah. people will rise up against you eventually. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you talk about the emperor having no clothes. I mean, the clothes <laughs> were a big part of the control that they exercised over people, having those special accoutrements. But, you know, we, we're talking about this. Now, you guys also worked on A Noble Lie, which is one of my favorite documentaries. I love to see. I knew when it came out. I had seen in the New American testimonies from the general who said, this is not the blast pattern that you're going to see from a car bomb or a single bomb, even, for that matter. So I knew that it was a, a false flag operation. I had no idea of everything that was in it that you guys found. Great detective work. 
Thank you very much. We, uh, we are very honored to have the opportunity to do that. And uh, basically correlating with this, this movie, that was more of a, a microcosm of, of government corruption. And what we wanted to do with State of Mind Psychology of Control was take that to the next level and say, we asked ourselves, why aren't people asking questions? Mm -hmm. Why aren't they mm -hmm. awake? Mm -hmm. Why can't they see the larger picture? Mm -hmm. So State of Mind Psychology of Control is actually laying out the tools. It's more of a primer. It's, it's, it's a jump point for the uninitiated. And then, of course, folks like us that understand all this, it, it comes naturally. But we wanted to open that door for the folks that aren't aware of, of the principles that uh, from cradle to grave. How are you controlled from education to media to, um, you know, there is a lot of government corruption going on. Whether they want to admit it or not, uh, you know, as, as the citizen, yes, this is existing and this is how you can handle it. And then we offer solutions. We go that extra step. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, education is, like I said, such a key part of it. Let's take a look at that clip that you've got from the, uh, from the documentary here. The education our children is, are going to get has nothing to do with education. It is training uh, our children to be uh, resources, human resources, that's the way they refer to us, to spin off profits for the globalists. The greatest barrier to discovery is not ignorance. It's the illusion of knowledge, and that's what the 15,000 hours in compulsory schooling really entrains in, in and conditions into us, is that you've been told this story of the people in South America, and so you think you know about it. And it's not until later in life when you might come across more information about conquistadors and how Jesuits infiltrated all their religious systems and, and took all the riches out and basically harvested this whole area. This is an example of plunder in South America that went on for hundreds of years. So until you have this other piece of information to bring this into focus, you think that what you were taught in public schooling during that 15,000 hours is really what's going on. And it's not until you bump up to, against reality, as George Orwell said, on a, usually on a battlefield, that you have to consider that which you were taught to believe versus the objective evidence that exists. John Taylor Gatto was an award-winning educator in New York who took kids that couldn't even read or write or headed for prison and made them top level students. And then he discovered that he was shut down by the big tax free foundations so that he couldn't teach the children this information. And he discovered that it was by design that they were dumbing people down to make them subservient biological androids or replicants. That's what we're seen as. But now we're obsolete. We're going to be phased out the new robotic systems, the drone aircraft, the drone submarines, the drone ships the drone robots on the ground. We're all being conditioned, all being acclimated for this. Wow, that was amazing. And that's a good point too, that you've got some really good people that you talked to. You got Jerry oh, yeah. Griffin, you got Charlotte Isabi that we just saw in that clip. Yeah, I mean, she was a policy advisor for the U.S. Department of Education. I mean, anybody that's researched Charlotte knows that she really knows her stuff. Mm -hmm. And she pretty much spits it right out there and mm -hmm. says that, you know, our, our school has nothing to do with training us to be critical thinkers or, or to be right. independent and mm -hmm. self-reliant. It's, it's to train us to be, a, a, you know, a gear in the machine, mm -hmm. uh, the globalist machine that, that's using us as resources. So they, they literally farm our energy in that way. And so uh, you know, when you have somebody at her level and her experience and the, the years of wisdom that she has under her that's just saying it as plain as day, it's, it's really hard to the know, avoid the obvious fact of right. what she's saying. The deliberate so, dumbing down of America. Absolutely. And John Taylor Gatto was another guy that we cover in the movie that, that really was a, a pioneer. Sure. Uh, you know, this guy really took you know, students who had been you know, given up on, you know, the system had mm -hmm. given up on these kids, and he was able to turn them into top-level students. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, really, he, at one point, he realized the you know, hypocrisy of the system, that, you know, that they didn't want him to actually train these kids to be intelligent, critical thinkers. They, you know, we want to keep people dumbed down to a certain degree so they're more subordinative to control. He was Teacher of the Year for two years oh, yeah. running, and, and they really came up to him. That's yeah. right. And he famously resigned his position in the Wall Street Journal, laying out all of the steps and what he found out since he started teaching, the corruption and, and just the, the lack of the basic foundation of respect for the children, empowering them to think versus actually suppressing their thinking. And um, the uh, underground education and the history of that, Tragedy and Hope, Richard Grove, Lisa Arbicheski, 
excellent writers, researchers, producer with the film. Lisa did the voiceover. They got to know Mr. Gatto on a personal level and really studied his work. It's phenomenal. It's an, an incredible body of work. Can you imagine of having him and Charlotte Isabeet and like-minded individuals running our education system in the U.S. today? It would be phenomenal. One of the best in the world. Well, you know, people, it's not just education. It's so many different institutions we have. People think that it has, the public thinks that it has one function, when in reality, it has a very different function. Exactly. And that's never been more true of any institution than government schools. Absolutely. I mean, I grew up in government schools, as you know, most children did, and you're basically just, it's repetitive to you know, train for these tests that are just about regurgitating useless facts. There are no classes in critical thinking and, and really uh, being creative. And, and ultimately, this country was founded on people being very creative and self-reliant. Mm -hmm. And slowly but surely, the education system that we have has bred that out of us to where now you have an epidemic of adults living with their parents well into their 40s in some cases. Yeah. because they d are not giving, given the basic skill set necessary to go out into the world and be a creative, positive force for humanity. And, and now they're sitting at home playing video games. That's right. Yeah, we see somebody famously said that education is not filling a bucket, but it's lighting a fire. Mm -hmm. But whenever a fire is lit in a student that's in a government institution, or even in private schools, they, because the private schools have their curriculum as well as their method of, of education mm -hmm. apes what is done in the government school. So, you know, when, you know, when you're in this rigid classroom environment, whenever a fire gets lit, it gets extinguished because you've got to move on, the bell rings, you go on to the next class. That's one of the things John Taylor Gatto used to say, you know, every 50 minutes the bell rings, you go do something completely different. You can't really ever focus on right. something. You just keep them scatterbrained. And it's, and it's designed that way intentionally. And, you know, I went through military basic training and mil military schools after that. And it's almost a, you know, more intense version of what public schools are. And everything is so regimented, you were never given an opportunity to make an autonomous decision for yourself. Every aspect of your life is micromanaged down to when you go take a break mm -hmm. and, and go to the restroom. Mm -hmm. uh, they don't want you ever having time to stop and, oh, I have a thought process. I can actually create ideas of my own. Mm -hmm. And, you know, John Rappaport in the film, you know, makes a great point that, you know, that's what the elites do is they try to convince you that you have no creative power. Mm -hmm. That way you look to them to mm -hmm. be the creative influence in your life and to provide the answers of how you're supposed to live your life. So when you go back and you look at the origins of mind control, and you look at the things that have been done for centuries, and especially, like I said, education we're talking about, it's so pervasive, so broadly applied, such a substrate of our civilization. But you also now talk about the more focused, more modern, more technological aspects of mind control, like uh, Operation Paperclip. Mm -hmm. And we've got a clip of that that we can show right now. Everybody around the State Department visa requirements get them into the country. Everybody knows about the race at the end of World War II to get Nazi scientists. The Russians wanted them, the United States and England wanted them. And the United States and England got most of them because the Nazis didn't want to go to the Soviet Union, another authoritarian system. They wanted to go to a, quote, freer system. And like an infection, they came to England, Canada, and the United States. and. It wasn't just over NASA and rocketry with Werner von Braun and Goddard and others. It was tens of thousands in mind control and torture and military science and surveillance. And the CIA got modeled to a great extent off of the Gestapo. And so we see really the evil of the Nazis being transplanted back to the United States and England where the eugenics philosophy that they had embraced had originally sprung. The Office of Strategic Services, the precursor of the CIA, under the direction of William Wild Bill Donovan and Alan Dulles, recruited Nazi scientists and aided their importation into America. Among them were rocket scientist Werner von Braun and the aeronautical physician Hubertus Strughold. The problem that the United States was facing was there was all these German scientists who were kind of in the wind, loose, wasn't clear where they were going to end up. And the uh, French, the British, the Russians, and the Americans were all trying to recruit them. The Germans had developed lots of different advanced weapons. And they'd also uh, done a lot of experimentation on human beings in the, in the uh, concentration camps. 
Uh, so they had a lot of medical data that we didn't have. We, they had, uh, of course, the rocket scientists and the airplane scientists and all the rest of it. And Paperclip was our version of going into Europe and finding these guys and bringing them to the United States to work. Wow. So now it's a very focused, very technological aspect of this. And a lot of people may have heard of Operation Paperclip, but I think the majority of people haven't. I mean, the aha moment for me was reading the Frank Olson book, uh, A Terrible Mistake, mm -hmm. where he was talking about, that was, he was talking about his involvement with the CIA mind control experiments and biological testing. He felt that had been a terrible mistake. That's one of the last things he said before right. he died. Well, uh, it was important that we put this aspect of, of mind control in the film, even though it doesn't deal directly with, you know, how it's influencing society, you know, directly in that way. Mm -hmm. it, what it shows is the, the level of research and, and money and time and energy that our government is putting into really focusing down on how to control us. You know, it shows what their agenda is and what their motivations are, mm -hmm. because it, it, if control wasn't on their agenda, it wasn't a part of their plan, they wouldn't be putting all this time, research source and energy, and then going to such great lengths to cover it up after the fact. Uh, we go into the False Memory Syndrome Foundation in the film, where basically all these MK doctors get on a board and they all come together and basically say uh, all these patients of you know, mind control, uh, you know, victims of mind control, you know, all these memories that they have are false memories that you know, were implanted by their <laughs> therapists and, and things like this. And, and so you know, it just kind of shows that not only are they doing all this research and, and putting all of their resources into it to get more information out about us, get more data that they can use to figure out how to control us better, you know, they're, they're going to great lengths to cover it up. And so, you know, any person with, you know, a critical mind that looks at the objective facts of that can tell that our governments have a very precise agenda of mm -hmm. control. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's going to really, as we were talking about before the interview, when we go over the news and people are coming at it from the perspective from the background, from the mindset, worldview that's been given to them in the schools and in the mass media, even if we link to the actual government documents to show what's going on, in most cases they'll just reject that because it doesn't fit the paradigm that they've been living under. Absolutely. And I think the thing that really changes people's minds is when they have a documentary that really lays this out historically. And you start from you know, the, the Middle Ages with Machiavelli essentially and bring it forward and show how there's been a deliberate effort to control the population. And these techniques have been, up to this point, broad and somewhat crude, but they're getting more and more refined and they can really focus that down to a, at an individual level. But there's a broader agenda as well, too. Right. Speak, yeah. speak to that. Yeah, um, you know, collectivism, exactly. right? I mean, that's mm -hmm. the ultimate agenda. Mm -hmm. What we're looking at, the ironic thing is, and uh, we try to point this out in the movie, is the advance of technology, quantum leaps uh, advance. And it, it actually can work in our favor because we can actually gather more information and for the folks that are empowered that they can use their critical thinking and say, hey, you know what, we, we can go back and study the historical context. What's going on today? We get this information fast enough, but what is good and what is bad information? And that's, it, I think it's a level of discernment and being able to sort things out is what we need to teach our children. Mm -hmm. They're not getting any of that all in, in public education. Private schools, possibly some, but uh, we find that even the homeschooling mm -hmm. is, is a good foundation because mm -hmm. you're really stepping out of this context and mm -hmm. saying, okay, this is the body of information we have. What, and again, what's good, what's bad, what's useful, and what do we want to teach our kids? Yes, absolutely. Well, like you said, all the information is out there. The technology is a two-edged sword, and it really is an info war, right? Exactly. And I, I think a really key fundamental tool in info war is documentaries like the one you just produced. I'm really excited to see the rest of it. That's State of Mind. As I said, it's available now as a pre-book at the InfoWarsStore.com. And it will be releasing. What's the release date on that? Do you know? I think they're looking at uh, starting to get those out to the customers around the, the middle part of J July, July, I believe. Yeah. July 17th, okay. Mm -hmm. So you'll see that on the website if you go to InfoWarsStore.com. It's going to be available for the first several months exclusively at InfoWars. Well, that's it for tonight. We'll be back Monday night, 7 Central, 8 p.m. Eastern.
Now you can watch The Alex Jones Show live as it happens at Infowars.com slash show. You'll find links to all of our content there and a free 15-day trial for Prison Planet TV. More than 60 movies and documentaries all in one place at Infowars.com slash show.